today what I'm going to be teaching um, is all about lateral versus literal. So for me, if I stop saying the word so would be a good start. This is, um, this is, I was thinking about this the other day of, I think the brands that surprise me uh, or charm me or impress me or, or I pay attention to um, will kind of, it's kind of, they do something a bit different. And I was trying to work out what is it that they do that's different to everyone else. And then how can I break that down in a way that I can show you what they're doing or what I notice about what they're doing. And then um, I, you can use it in your own work. And I think for this example this week, I'm going to talk about lateral versus literal. And obviously when lateral, I'm talking about a sideways kind of lateral thinking and literal is doing kind of what's easy and predictable. And this is how I explain what I mean. So repetition in itself is, is really boring. We understand what's coming. We know what's coming. And once we've seen something familiar, it becomes wallpaper. So effectively our brain is always looking for this thing of, do I need to pay attention to it in case it's dangerous? And if I don't, then I can tune it out. And so once we've seen something which is familiar, it becomes easy for us to basically, we get very good at ignoring it. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen this when you're looking at kind of YouTube ads that feel familiar or pop-ups that look the same or are selling the same things, we just swipe past them or we're just waiting for the five seconds until we can close the pop-up. Um, and it's this thing of, even if we've not seen it before, if it does feel the same, it's gonna get tuned out. And the bad thing is if you're producing work that's feeling familiar or people feel they've seen it before, you're gonna get tuned out. And it's gonna be very, very hard once people have made the decision on what they think of you to actually win them back because they'll have tuned you out as well. And so the problem now is I've got to try and do things actually different to get people's attention when they've already kind of dismissed me as being predictable. But this whole predictable behavior like the carousels is completely natural because as a species, we're wired and we've evolved to keep doing what's worked. That's how we survive. It's all about reinforcing successful neural pathways. So if you are hunting for an animal as a cave person and you find a way of trapping one, you're going to do the same thing again until it stops working and you'll try something else. But you're not going to go, oh, well, that worked, but let's try something completely new. It, it, you don't do that. So this is why people just repeat what works because it's safe and convenient. What I'm trying to encourage to you is that's a danger. So we need to try and find a way of breaking that. And we need to stop thinking, you know, so literally as in like, right, this works, let's keep repeating it. And we need to think more laterally and be a bit braver and try a slightly different approach, which I think in the long term um, will have a bigger benefit from us. And I think that starts with taking a sideways step. What I'm talking about here is surprise. And, you know, if you look at a punchline, good punchlines, they rely on taking you in one direction before bringing you back round. If you think you know the punchline and it's what you know, it's boring because you've connected the dots and said, well, I, know, I can see where this is going. And quite often, if you think you know where it's going, you tune out. But the best punchlines are the ones you can kind of relate to, but then they shock and surprise you. And that is, you know, the way we're going to do this. And like I said, it's the same with magic. It's all about misdirection. So I wanted to illustrate this point here. Will it play? Okay. You know, there's a word, uh, misdirection, yep. that's uh, used by lay people a lot. It's a magical term. It's a term of art. And the way lay people use it is wrong. Because lay people often use it as a, as a synonym for distraction. Like, hey, look over there, do something sneaky here, and then you look back and the, the trick is done. That doesn't fool anyone. Mm -hmm. The way we use the word misdirection is kind of a, a curating of attention, giving the audience a story that can tell themselves that lets them not really know they were distracted. We're going to do a trick right now using misdirection. I'm going to tell you what it is. The trick is the vanishing chicken. There's a chicken in there. We're going to make it disappear. Now, when I say give you a story to tell yourself, it's not some jive-ass story like this is Clucky McCluckface and this is the chicken coop rocket ship to Mars, no, a real story, which is you know it's a vanishing chicken. I've told you that. Yes. You know we're Penn and Teller. You know we do magic tricks. So as soon as I cover up this chicken, you're telling yourself what you're going to do. You're telling yourself a story. You're making yourself a promise.
Because you're promising yourself right now that at no time will you allow your attention... <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> Misdirection. Now, yeah. Jimmy, I want to see how well this works. Can we have the house lights up so I can see people? Yeah, I just want to see. Show of hands. How many of you saw the gorilla with the symbols? Should be everyone. It's a goddamn gorilla with symbols. <laughs> Should be all of you. Yes, Good. yeah. Now, a subset of that, how many of you saw Teller walk out here, cop the chicken, and split? That's, that's almost everyone, too. Now, here's yeah. where the misdirection comes in. How many of you, during all of that, saw a sneak the gorilla into the cage? How many people saw that? Because that's what? misdirection. Oh, my God. Right yeah. there. So, there we go. So, that's the thing of when it happens and it's not what we're expecting, it's surprising. And where this comes down to everything, so it's not just creativity. If you're looking at fusion of cooking, if you, you know, anything that is where you're taking something from, you're mixing things up to surprise people. And this is simple because if something is out of context, it's surprising. So as I've seen there with like the Skittles or whatever they're called, all of a sudden the orange one feels important, but the only reason is that it's out of context. It doesn't matter at all. And this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to say, okay, how can I make what I'm doing stand out and be different from everything else? Because surprising is, interesting it's fresh it's memorable and, and that's what we're trying to do we're trying to stand out so people remember who we are and what we do because if we're surprising and memorable we get talked about and that ultimately is what we need to be doing both as creative people but for our clients we want to get people talking about us and like i said if you learn from other industries and you look at comedy entertainment and cooking swapping things over and like mixing things about seems to be an interesting thing to play with and I'm going to give some examples of people who do it really well. So the first one is Johnny Cupcakes. Um, I'm not sure if you probably most of you will know who Johnny Cupcakes is, but Johnny Cupcakes makes clothing, mainly T-shirts and caps and all that kind of stuff. And they're enormously successful and very cool. But what is interesting about it is that every shop is designed to be like a bakery. So as you can see, this is like a you know pastry display. You'd get a bakery. You've got ovens with T-shirts in. And I think they might even, I'm not sure, but they might pump sort of bakery smells around. And their stores are very popular um, because of this experience. And it's, it is surprising. And, and people have been known to walk into a cupcake store and be annoyed that there's no cupcakes and there's just T-shirts. The whole thing of all he's done is take a T-shirt store and put it in a bakery, but then dial it up a little bit. And it's surprising and it's different. And he's backed it up with good quality designs, admittedly, but just this juxtaposition and swapping of stuff is what makes him memorable, makes him popular. It's a good publicity stunt and people queue up for the experience and they want to buy the stuff because if I'm queuing for the experience, I'm in the store, I want to take home a memento like I do when I go to a theme park. So he's selling stuff as well. So it's enormously successful for him. Another person is David Bowie. Now, there is a phrase which is kind of, look where no one else is looking. And now I admittedly, I'm not, I don't know much about Dave Barry's music, but I can look at him objectively and see how he was constantly evolving and changing. And as a, a musical artist was absolutely standout. And the reason was that was because he was taking inspiration from other genres of music, mixing them in with what he was doing and surprising people. And when you do this, you also get things like this, the cockapoo, which is an exceedingly successful dog which is a mixture of a cocker spaniel and a poodle. It's just this thing of, it feels new and different because we're mixing things up. And if we're gonna do this in our work, for me, it, the mixing up of ideas and themes in a lateral way, not a literal way, is where it starts to get interesting. Now, the secret to doing this properly, which I was working out was this. You can swap your inspiration of your industries, but you must keep your audience. So this is really important because we don't want to just be swapping for the sake of it because it's not going to resonate. So if I'm running, uh, you know, if I want to produce a brand and my customer is into sort of, I want to sort of produce a high-end brand, but my customer um, isn't into high-end brands, but I'm going to swap around and surprise them, but they're still not going to buy it because ultimately whatever I'm selling is not for them. So the key is to swap the industries that you take inspiration from but keep the, the customer in mind. So I'll illustrate that here. 
let's say my new client is a burger restaurant. Now they want to target this type of customer. So in a very basic analysis, this is the branding that this customer resonates with. He loves nice cars, watches, nice clothes, posh hotels, and sort of razor blades and all that kind of stuff. If we look at those type of brands, you can kind of see and you can get an idea of what they like. So if we look at typically the two industries, so if we're going into the burger industry, this is our competition. We're up against places like Burger King, McDonald's, Wendy's, all these people, but the brands that the customers we want to target are here. So there's a real disparity between, well, if I go down a typical burger industry aesthetic, it's not going to appeal to the customer I want to talk to. And it's when you do an analysis, you break it down. So you go, okay, if we're doing an X, Y analysis of the type of businesses, generally all of the burger restaurants are cheap and mass production, yet all of the brands that our customer really likes are all bespoke and expensive. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to enter the burger market, but actually move away from all of our rivals and try and create a brand that would look like it feels absolutely at home if it was next to a Mercedes showroom. And this is the sort of mentality around it. And the way you would do this as an example would be, okay, I'm just gonna break down what are the commonalities between the aesthetics and the colors of the type of branding within our rivals for that type of market, which is obviously a lot of red and yellow, nice rounded sans serif typefaces, bright colors, they've got a character there, it's fun, it's bold and inviting, versus this is the aesthetic that they're attracted to. So as you can see, it's a lot more muted, the tones, it's much more sort of monochromatic. You've got sharp edges and clean line, it's refined, it's elegant and it's luxurious versus bold, fun and inviting. So if I'm gonna try and create a burger identity I'm going to want to put it in this industry because that's our business but I'm going to want to give it the aesthetic of the brands that the person looks for so I might come up with something which is like this which is a high-end looking burger restaurant that has all the hallmarks of all the other high-end brands but it's still a burger restaurant so what I'm doing traditionally is I'm in this industry but I'm taking my inspiration from another industry and I'm bringing it back here to create this high end look and feel, which when you put it in the X, Y axis, this is where it's gonna set, sit, and this is where it's gonna be standout because this identity compared to what is familiar is different because I've stepped sideways to draw inspiration from a high end market to create an identity that feels are high end and luxurious, but it's just different. And I think if you continue this kind of look and feel onwards, and you can imagine the aesthetic of if the burger restaurant felt like a, a jeweler's or a watch shop where it was quite refined, everyone was smartly dressed. You can really change the experience and you can change to create a brand that although we want to enter the burger market, now we actually created the white space because these are not burger restaurants. Where you want to be is in the bespoke expensive section. But in order to justify that, you need to adopt an aesthetic and a way of behaving that is like an expensive bespoke brand and so this is all i'm trying to give the example of instead of trying to do something which you know the, the predictable route is to do a burger restaurant which is just a bit more of a sort of refined version of this but we don't want to stray too far from the aesthetics because this is what people accept as being familiar i'm saying go the other end create something completely unique and unusual and surprise people and then stand out in your marketplace but this sideways step or kind of cross pollination can work in all sorts of things. So if you look at, if you're looking for color inspiration, I've talked about this a lot. When you're looking for color, it's very, very easy for you to kind of stay in your lane, look on dribble, look on Pinterest and kind of look at other designs, other branding identities, seeing what's working. And what I'm saying is you want to take a sideways step. And although you're in the branding circle, if you look instead of laterally in your industry and you look sideways to photography or interior design, it's the bit where they overlap, which is where you can take something from that industry and bring it back or vice versa. That's where the magic happens. And when you start to do this and you look at things like Farrow and Ball, you're kind of in this area of where I'm, these are color swatches taken from these photos and you can see all the tones there. That immediately when transferred onto sort of nice packaging, has got all the hallmarks of being extremely nice sort of 
interesting tones. And I don't think you would easily find tones as bold and refined as that if you were looking for sort of branding inspiration. But again, what we're doing is we're looking into another industry, but we're still retaining the audience. So if I, so these colors are for an upmarket brand, which is exactly, Fire and Ball is an upmarket brand. It's just a case of, it's the same customer, it's just, it's just a different shop that they you know buy things from. But this way, we're doing it. And I thought I'd give you an exact example of how I've done this in the past to come up with interesting colors. So this was an identity I did for this um, investment group called the Astura Group. And this was the photo I took the inspiration from. The tones are slightly balanced to adjust. But what I'm saying is this Victoria Ling photo was where I was looking for color inspiration because I think she's brilliant at color. And I love the way that the navy and the pink played against each other with this gray. So that was where I started with trying to bring in the color palette. So this is how you can take the colors from photography and apply them to a traditional branding setup. And they will elevate the branding to be much different. And because the client loved the colors particularly, it gave me a really good starting point with what we're gonna do with those. And I think you'd probably sparingly use the pink, but regardless, I wonder if I would have on my own come up with that kind of inspiration if I'd stayed looking into the familiar lanes that I would always say return to. Again, if we're looking at aesthetics about what a brand looked like, here's another example. If we look at the bottled water market, I was approached by a client in Australia to, it's, um, we're gonna be working on a project to create the branding for, they want it to be, the, it's the, it's, I think it's been tested and it's one of the world's purest waters. So it's like 150 meters underground in somewhere in Australia and it's stunning. So they're going, look, we wanna go into the market. We wanna make it kind of very, very high end, very refined, very pure. So I'm like, okay, great. And they sent over examples of other luxury waters and they just felt very glitzy and brash. They weren't refined, they had no quality. So I'm beginning to think of, okay, if we break this down, I'm gonna say the people we've got to appeal to are gonna be affluent people who are stylish and sophisticated and have a lot of money. They care about status. So that's who we're gonna go after. Now, I thought, well, what is another liquid in a bottle that's sold for a very expensive price? And the answer is perfume. So I'm thinking, okay, can we take a lesson from the perfume market and take inspiration from that market and bring it back into the bottled water market to create something like this? Now, this isn't the final concept, it's just to illustrate the point, but if I saw that as a bottle of water on a table, I'm already thinking this is expensive, it's probably delicious, uh, it's a rarefied commodity. I'm completely, as a consumer, the aesthetics are completely changing my value perception of the actual product itself. And this is, again, it's this thing of, I'm looking into another industry to be inspired and I'm bringing my learning and the aesthetics back to this. And because it's water, and as you said, it could be a high-end spirit as well, it's the thing of what we, do, we, we associate high, high volume alcohol to look like this, but we don't associate it from water. And that's a surprising thing because when we look back at all these other bottles, they're all fairly familiar, they're of a, of a certain ilk. And then we come back to this and it's just a statement piece that people want to show off and they want to bring out to dinner and they want to pour a bottle and you should taste this water, it's the best. All of that plays into it, but for us, it's going to attract the right audience at a, the right price point and it's all about supply and demand. So this is where we're going with it. Another example of lateral versus literal is the Dove Self-Esteem Project. Now, a lot of us all kind of um, know where you've got kind of, you know, Dove is very well known for kind of talking about the more emotional side of their marketing and not always leaving on kind of how soft your skin is. But when you break down the way they do it, this is what I mean. So if you take a Dove normally, the literal approach is, well, we make your skin soft, which is going to make you feel more confident. That's why you should buy it. So it's a very logical way of selling to someone, which you would see in a lot of other brands. But the problem is when you're taking this approach, it's very much price driven. And if there is another brand that is cheaper, you might or better value or on a deal, you might choose that one. And often if it's a price driven decision, it's, it's a race to the bottom. What Dove have done is they're still selling confidence, but they've taken a sideways stat and they've looked at their purpose and they thought our purpose is all about empowering women, making them feel confident and celebrating who they are. So we want to give them self-esteem 
which in turn is going to give them the confidence. So the self-esteem bit is what we focus on. So by taking this lateral approach, we're more likely to sell to them because when it's purpose driven, you're not competing on price. So in this case, Dove, by taking that sideways step and that lateral purpose driven approach, they automatically distinguish themselves in the market from the competition. They now can price at whatever it matters. It doesn't matter. And even people who don't buy their product are more likely to support it because they like what they do. And in the modern economy, purpose driven brands always perform better than price driven brands. So that's an example in, the, in that market. Now, another industry, hotels. Now, I know this industry very well. The mistake that us hotel owners make is we love to show pictures of our rooms, of how nice they look, and we spend a lot of money on photography, and we talk about the facilities and how you get breakfast included, and our staff are really friendly. And they talk about all those kind of things to sell what they're selling, and I understand that. It's very logical. I've been there. But actually, when guests come to stay at a hotel, they spend most of their time eating out in nice restaurants, going on you know, fun activities like playing golf or whatever it might be, relaxing or visiting local attractions. So what the guests are doing is very different to what the hotels are selling. And if you break it down, you realize actually the, the, the guests spend such a small amount of time enjoying the facilities of the hotel, their goal and the reason they've come to the place is to do all the other things. So in actual fact, if you're selling a hotel, most hotels go literal and they sell their facilities, such as we have a gym, we have freshly squeezed orange juice, we have uh, awards for our staff service. We're all selling enjoyment, but the facilities can be matched and bettered by another hotel, the star system, whatever. The lateral approach is to sell the memories, is to sell what do you do on holiday? Why do you do it? And actually, that lateral, more emotive driven approach is far more powerful because when you come back from the holiday, what you bring home with you is the memories. What stay with you are the memories and the stories. And what you talk about are the memories and the stories. You don't talk about the facilities because the facilities are boring and they only engage one part of your brain where the memories light up the entire part of the brain because they're far more exciting. So it's very much, we're gonna go literal with facilities versus lateral with memories. And what hotels need to do is they need to start thinking like an estate agent, because as you know, with Google and estate agents, it's all about location, location, location. And both the customers want care about the location. So that if the hotel thinks like an estate agent, all they need to do now is they need to focus on make people fall in love with where you are and they will come. So the value of this is, okay, I'm running a hotel, once I've shown everyone our rooms or our cooked breakfasts or our staff, I'm starting to dry up with content. Nobody's going to follow a hotel account that just shows the rooms because unless you're definitely going to stay, it's not that interesting. And when you have stayed, it really isn't that interesting. The key is to go, well, how about we stop focusing on the hotel and focus on the area so we can attract people to the area. And because if they're following us, it's even easier for us to sell to them because we can promote our offers while they're following. And then we can begin to build our account through interesting content because again, if we think like an estate agent, if they were trying to sell us a place we're moving to, they would talk about what good gyms and sports clubs are available, the great restaurants, what activities they can do, the beaches, all of those things. That's what an estate agent would sell you. All the things you can do while you're living here. If we switch it to a hotel, the hotel could do exactly the same thing. So, as soon as the hotel starts to think like an estate agent and actually just spends most of its time promoting the area, not only will it get more viewers, more likes, more followers, because it's interesting, but they're going to have so much more content to talk about, so much more things to collaborate on, and other people are going to refer them. And this is, again, it's this literal versus lateral. It's like, well, but what about our facilities versus, no, no, no. What the people, how do they behave when they're with you? They spend all their time outside enjoying the environment around you, not staying inside the hotel, enjoying the facilities. And that's the big difference. And again, it's this literal versus lateral. Okay, last few ones here. Here is a record label that acts like a church. And when I say like that, I'm talking about defected records. And the reason why I say they act like a church is because they are religious about house music. Instead of talking about music and you know, just generally like who's making it, who they look, charts, all that sort of stuff. They eulogize about the power of house music. And here's some of their content. 
Now, all of these kind of phrases, house is a feeling, in our house we're all equal, never underestimate the power of house music. You could easily swap out the words house music for God and rearrange it to make it grammatically correct and it wouldn't feel out of place. And that's the thing. What they're doing is they are getting people to bond over house music. And if you're into house music, there are lots of different types. But the whole thing is, if we celebrate music, we just bring together people for the love of music. And now celebrating the love of music is so much easier than just talking about what records we've got coming out. It's the whole thing of, instead of buy our record, it's like, let's celebrate music. So with this, when they do their virtual festivals and they showcase new DJs and they talk about experiences or what was the first track you, or a track you'll never skip, or they're engaging all those emotive moments that remind us why we love music and they're tying it back to what their record label does. So one in 10 posts is a promotional post about a record they're selling. The rest of it is just like, we love house music. And again, there's an infinite content reservoir of stuff they could focus on but this is a sort of all embracing, we bring everyone together with a love for house music and that's why it's so powerful. So as I said, if you're gonna do this and you're gonna swap things, there are certain aspects you have to focus on. One to try could be looking different. It might just be purely an aesthetic thing. You can also sound different. So maybe this is down to your kind of personality or tone of voice. You can behave differently to stand out. So again, all we're trying to do is go, well, if I'm doing a high-end burger bar, but it is going to behave like a Mercedes garage. What is it about Mercedes garage that transfers into the burger sort of place that is going to make that experience different and make it stand out? And ultimately, you've got to try and think different. And that is where the lateral step comes in. It's always maybe go back to your purpose, maybe kind of play with things, but take that lateral step to do something different because it will stand out. And when you're swapping two industries and that genuinely, like I said, you swap industries, but keep the audience, it becomes really easy because when you start to play with aesthetics, like I've got here from McDonald's and Tiffany's, it changes how you feel about that brand. It changes who it resonates with and more importantly, the price point and who it appeals to. So this is the thing. If you swap industries and aesthetics and the way brands behave, you have a really good chance to make them stand out and just see what happens. It doesn't have to be the answer, but the point being is if you take this step and you go away from something which is literal and predictable and based on features and price, something logical that is very, very comfortable within that industry and move to something which is surprising, purpose-driven about emotion, memories, and from outside of that industry, you're going to develop really, really interesting and dynamic creative that is not going to only elevate your clients, but it's going to elevate your own work as well. So that was my, um, the final bit of teaching about why I think you should go lateral instead of literal.